Welcome back for episode three of the Van Diemen Formula Ford restoration. And on today's episode, we're getting into some meaty bits. We've got essentially the rear of the car here. It's got the engine dry sump in it. It's got all suspension mounting points for the rear of the car. The shocks mount to this. This is a large piece of the rear of the car and it's the gearbox. It's the Hewland LD200. It's a four speed dog box. It's quite unique if you haven't worked with, with this sort of transaxle setup before, but it's actually quite serviceable and quite nice to work on. It's been many, many years since I've worked on it. So anybody that picks up that I'm doing stuff wrong, please leave a comment and, and let me know what I'm doing. But we need to get this thing busted open and see what's inside. I hope it's got oil in it. I hope it's not full of corrosion and I hope it's not full of broken parts, but there's only one way to find out. The first thing we need to do is drain any oil out of this. If we start pulling covers off, we're gonna make a hell of a mess. So for the magic of television, I've loosened the drain plugs. They're an aluminum drain plug. They're quite large, but for some reason, they always seem to be over tightened and, and really round. So I've loosened this bottom plug. We're gonna pull it out and we're gonna, we're gonna see what we find. I'm draining it into a clean container. So if it's full of shrapnel, I'll know. Fingers crossed. It's, well, there you go. It's actually got some oil in it, which is, which is good. It doesn't look like it's full of, uh, full of water. The drain plugs have got a big magnet on it. I'll bring it over. And as you can see, there's a fair bit of fur on that magnet, which isn't uncommon. Keep in mind, this is a dog box. So if you're not really efficient at changing gears and positive, the dogs will peel the teeth off um, radius the corners and you'll probably see when we get it apart. So that could just be leftover parts from a couple of miss shifts. No big bits. The oil's pretty clean, things are looking good. I'm gonna let that drain for a little bit and then we'll start at the back of the gearbox and start pulling the covers off and getting some gears out. With this gearbox, we're gonna start at the back of the gearbox and work our way forwards, work our way towards the diff center. I've got my parts tray laid out, so we're just about ready to buzz these nuts off. And I've already realized we've got one broken stud and two of them have got double nuts on it. So it's not looking real good to start with, but we'll get this off. Well, we'll try to get this off and we'll see what we can find. Good to see the double nuts are giving us, giving us dramas already. But those, those studs are well and truly threaded. Um, that's the wrong nut. I don't know what that fits. Wow. It's got a got a tapered washer on it for a, like a countersunk bolt, which is jammed on there pretty well. Nice. I would expect to get a little bit of oil out of this back cover, but not an amazing amount. And that's reverse gear. Pretty clean in there. It's had um, it's had some gears let go. There's some marks in the bottom of the housing, which isn't uncommon. There's, if you break stuff, it, it's gonna leave some marks and that certainly has, I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Now the trick to getting all this apart is engaging two gears at once, normally select the cable, goes through the bell housing, all the way down beside the driver. So using these, I can flip that out of the way and select two gears. Remove the split pin and start undoing some nuts and we'll start getting some gears off and then the next cartridge will come off and then we can keep working our way in. Now I've removed the split pins from the main shafts, we can loosen these. The top nut is left-handed thread, the bottom is conventional. Now the best way to hold this is to push in two gears at once. So we've got first and reverse and that gearbox is completely locked. So we can put the, the breaker bar on these nuts and loosen them easily without the wheels turning. And it's also the same way to tighten them up. If you can lock the gearbox up, that way you're not trying to hold the car still or if somebody's got their foot on the brake or something silly like that. It just locks the gearbox solid and allows you to loosen those nuts. Now I've already loosened them. So we can spin the top nut off. We're looking at reverse gear here. It's got the, um, the idler shaft in it, the idler pulley. The nuts look quite good. The, the, the studs 
like we assumed were completely completely stuffed and even the um the selector for maybe it's it's had the end re-welded on it it's got a lot of grind marks all over it so something's definitely gone on there all of this can uh, can come apart i'll grab an allen key in a second and remove the the fork completely for reverse gear it'll make my life a little bit easier and same i'll loosen the nut and get rid of the idler gear so then that'll be reverse gear completely gone and then we can pull this next cover off Now we've got everything we need out of the back of the housing to get the next part of the housing off. Now normally on a gear ratio change at the track, a lot of that stuff wouldn't come off. Like I said, they're quite serviceable and user friendly. And you can get that whole cartridge off as one piece, change the ratios you need and then just put it back on. But because we are stripping everything down anyway, it's all gotta come apart and get cleaned up. Now what we have found is the idler for reverse gear is looks like it's come loose it's been half engaged at some stage and it's other than really rounding the teeth it's actually taken a fair bit out of the gear if i can try to show you that it's taken quite the edge off the gear so whether one of the shafts have come loose and the gears have moved around and, and half engaged with that but that's that's a bit bizarre and i'm sure there'll be more to that story when we get the next bit out with this next cover removed that exposes all the gears first through fourth also the shifter forks uh, needle bearings um, what we're looking at here is top shaft's the pinion goes in and drives the crown wheel and the bottom shaft is actually the input shaft so that's like a an extension to the input shaft and then the rest of that shaft goes all the way out the front of the gearbox so it drives from the engine all the way to the back up then back into the pinion when the gears come apart normally we've got a tool that we slide over the shaft so they all come out in one bit it's at the other shop unfortunately but we get them apart like that so that shows the two gears with the dog ring in the middle and once these come apart we can clean them up we can see how worn the dog rings are which i can tell you now they're pretty worn um, and some of those gears are actually that that bad they're, they're not serviceable they'll go straight in the bin but still we'll go through the processes we'll clean it up we'll make sure everything uh, we need is replaced we don't miss anything um, but we'll keep going we'll get the crown wheel out of this and the crown wheel opinions a huge part of of this assembly and probably the single most expensive bit of the the rear of the car is they they're hugely expensive normally have a really good service life but you use the wrong oil or you run it low on oil or or just plain simply do too many kilometers they they get worn out the hard facing comes off and they deteriorate really quickly so we'll keep moving we'll get some more off this and we'll see what we can find Probably my single biggest concern about this whole project was the condition of the diff. And I think it was because it was unknown. It was in the housing and nobody really knew what sort of condition it was in. And now it's out of the car, it actually looks pretty good. 
Wear-wise, it looks good. The bearings and the, the bearing uh, cones look good. Where the pinion's been running on the crown wall even looks pretty good. The housings are nice and clean inside, but obviously we still need to clean it up and make sure it's okay. This outer housing that comes out and brings the, the whole diff centre out with it, it's got the little drive stubs that um, captured in the outside bearings there. We'll pull them out and we'll make sure they're okay. I, I mark them left and right just so we don't put them in backwards and spin them the wrong way in case they do have a twist in them. We don't want to untwist them because they're more likely to break. I'll tip the oil out of the housing and we'll get the front off. We'll get the dry sump tank out. We'll get the input shaft out and we'll see how that looks. It's only a few bolts to get these two housings apart. So now it's essentially what was the gearbox and what is the bell housing. The input shaft, you can really see how long it is. It's only just thick enough to handle the horsepower that the CAN engine makes. But that with the short extension on the back, it's a massive amount of, uh, amount of twist. And you can hear it sometimes between gear changes, it'll, it'll get a bit of a whip in the RPM. And that's just a twist in that input shaft. All this has got to come apart, we want a bare housing. We need to get these housings dipped to get rid of all the corrosion and bring them back to how they should be. We next need to strip the bell housing. We need the dry sump tank out of it. You can probably see in that shot, there's a small hole on the bottom. That hole's through the bottom of the dry sump tank for the input shaft. Like I said, it's a clever solution to what could have been a very difficult problem of mounting the dry sump tank. Dry sump tanks need to be tall and skinny to work efficiently and there wouldn't have been too many other places in the car that you could mount this without affecting the bodywork. And the smaller the bodywork, the more aerodynamic the car is. It's a bit of a pain to pull the tank out of the bell housing. It's open at the bottom, so it seals via a couple of rings and a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of sealant. But that being open at the bottom makes it really easy for me to get in there and tap that top back out to, to fix where that's been punched in or or had something dropped on it. The tank, that's the uh, the overflow for the tank. It goes into the bell housing, so the bell housing then becomes the catch can. That whole area can then fill up with oil and it'll eventually dribble out probably the input shaft. Um, the suction screen comes out the side. You saw me pull that out. There's actually a, an inspection bung in the bottom of the, um, the bottom of the bell housing that, that looks up into the center of the tank. And it's full of quite a lot of shrapnel actually. The original engine that I built for the car back in the day, somebody's exploded and it looks like they haven't really cleaned the tank out too well. So, Really, uh, really glad that we've pulled that apart, but we're at that point now where we, we can start cleaning the stuff up and see exactly what we've got gearbox wise. We've got it all laid out and I'll probably uh, delegate that to somebody else. But thanks for watching. That's it for this episode. Next episode, I think we'll get into the engine. We've, we've got an engine there for it, but 
It's unknown like this. We need to at least pull the covers off and maybe do a leak down on it and see what we've got. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed and I'll see you on the next episode for the Van Diemen restoration.